Elden Ring is the newest game by From Software, and it's far and away their most popular title, selling more than 12 million copies thus far and capturing the attention of nearly everyone in the gaming sphere. It also received an insane amount of praise, specifically for its progression of the open world genre. This praise and attention sparked many debates online about AAA open world game design in general, even getting to the point where some seemingly salty game devs who worked on other open world games took to Twitter to talk down about it. Now, this discourse is part of the reason why I wanted to make this video today, because I think Elden Ring's design is worth analyzing, but I've also been sitting on this video idea for quite a while because, frankly, I'm a little tired of modern open world game design. Now, let's not to suggest that I just hate open world games, but rather that I get frustrated with how safe and formulaic so many of them feel when I know they could be better. To me, this is really highlighted by the way Elden Ring manages to balance so many moving parts, and I genuinely think it surpasses every single other open world game that came before it. Yes, including Breath of the Wild, and I don't even think it's really close. But I also don't think Elden Ring is doing anything completely unheard of. Like, it doesn't have some revolutionary mechanic or design that we've never seen, it's just that it takes lessons learned from the past decade of open world games and improves upon them in pretty much every way while also navigating the pitfalls and adding its own flair. Now, I'm gonna try to cover a lot of ground in this video and I understand I will probably be making some bold claims, but if you stick it out, I think I'll be able to explain myself pretty well. And if you don't agree with something I said, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. The first couple sections of this video are mainly going to cover some of the issues I have with open world design, and then I'll kind of transition into a comparison and analysis of why I think Elden Ring works so well. And before we begin, no, this video isn't sponsored, but I would really appreciate it if you could check out my new action short film. I'm very happy with how it came out, and I would love to hear people's thoughts. The link's in the description if you're at all interested. Alright, with that out of the way, let's talk about some open world games. If you followed my channel for a bit, you'll know that I'm not the biggest fan of open world games. Four or five years ago I was a bit more on board, but that was admittedly because I just hadn't played as many of them back then. However, the more I played, the more I started to realize how similar and monotonous a lot of these games can be. Now, whenever someone says this, everybody expects to see a bunch of Ubisoft titles pop up on screen, and while yes, Ubisoft does kinda suck, the issue goes far beyond just them. In fact, I think many critically acclaimed games still fall into this sterile, unimaginative formula with the same tropes and characteristics you'll find in a hundred other games. And it also feels like so many game franchises nowadays just have to be open world, like it's the new default game you're supposed to make. Mirror's Edge Catalyst, Halo Infinite, Breath of the Wild, Mass Effect Andromeda, Ghost Recon Wildlands, and Metro Exodus, all sequels from previously linear franchises that decided to turn into open world games. And only two of them managed to have an open world worth talking about in any capacity. Now obviously, not all games are going to be one-to-one -one comparisons, so keep in mind that everything I say will always have some exceptions, but in my eyes, when you look at open world games, a majority of them fall into a category of what I would call standard open worlds, or as others refer to them, Ubisoft open worlds. And unless the game is very linear like Metro Exodus, or completely open-ended and procedural like No Man's Sky, it will likely fall somewhere around this scale. Now, having a standard open world doesn't mean a game is immediately bad or anything, it's just that it's usually pretty safe and formulaic, it's something you've seen and played before. On the surface level, standard open worlds are the ones with overly inflated play spaces, map icons everywhere, and giant, hey idiot look over here markers, or endless checklists telling you exactly what to do at all times. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Now don't get me wrong, I think many of these games do have over-designed intrusive UIs that spend too much time babying the player's every move, but removing them is simply a surface level fix, and saying that what sets Elden Ring apart is that this game is more open-ended with less HUD elements is a pretty weak analysis and unfair to the rest of the game's strengths. Because you can turn off most of the UI in any of these games, and shocker, the quality of the game doesn't improve, and sometimes it can even be made worse, as many of these games are so rigidly designed from the ground up to handhold the player, so taking away the UI can just make it more confusing. Hell, I mean a few years ago, everybody loved to point the finger at the Ubisoft towers as one of the big bads of modern gaming. So then Ubisoft made a huge deal about removing towers from Far Cry, yet they still shat out the least imaginative pile of ass in Far Cry 6, so clearly the towers aren't the actual problem. For me, the biggest issues with these games tend to come in the form of minimal variety, filler content, wasted space, and the lack of overall complexity. 
For whatever reason, there's this really weird trend in the gaming industry where some people perceive length as a sign of quality, and some companies seem to think that simply advertising how obnoxiously long your game is is the best way to get people excited. I wish this weren't the case, but I know for a fact that there are some people, some who I know personally, that think a game's value is intrinsically tied to how long it's going to take to play. I don't know what percentage of people think this, but apparently it's enough that game developers and publishers still think people just simply want bigger games. Now, I fundamentally disagree with this mindset, and I also think it's kind of been a bit harmful to the games industry as a whole, as far too many games come out with these massive sizes that just don't need to be that big. I've said this before, but so many of the recent open world games that I wasn't a huge fan of, and hell, even some of the ones that I did like, would have been better if they were significantly smaller or just not open world at all. Cyberpunk 2077 is a great example of this. Really cool seeing the city until you realize that you can't interact with 95% of things out there and the vast majority of it is simply a facade that's there to fill space. And there lies the first problem with all open world games, utilizing space. When developers make these big ass worlds, the initial challenge they face is filling the play space with interesting things to do. But when you have such a massive space to fill, this can be pretty daunting. So they often resort to rehashing things you've already seen, randomizing the content, or cutting corners on the content itself, sometimes all three combined. Because open world games can sit and claim that they have hundreds of missions or activities, but how many of them are actually unique or worthwhile? Too often they'll only have about five different types of content, but then they'll copy and paste those five ideas 20 times each across the map. Take Ghost of Tsushima for example. Following dumbass footprints was not really fun the first time I did it, and it was even less fun the tenth time. It's just a boring trailing mission. Then leveling up your charm slot requires you to follow a fox, which is also just another glorified trailing mission, and then of course, we have the full-on trailing missions where you walk behind an NPC for five minutes. All of these are just trailing missions with different coats of paint on them. This game also has an issue with its randomized interactions that are just not good enough to warrant having them repeated as much as they are. The biggest culprit of this is coming across some NPC who needed to be rescued from a group of Mongols. Seeing it once or twice is kinda cool, but there are like a hundred of these fucking encounters spread throughout this 40 hour game. Same thing with blowing up trucks or rescuing civilians in Far Cry 5 or chasing down thugs in Dying Light 2. You can't go 10 feet without finding another one. When it's so frequent, it no longer feels like an interesting random encounter, it just feels like bland content made to pad out the space of the game. And bandit camps are literally in every single open world game, and are prime suspect numero uno as an example of devs filling empty space, but I have a separate section later just for those, so I won't get into that yet. But either way, I know, I know, these are all optional side activities, Chris. You don't need to complete them. Well, allow me to counter with this. I think they all kinda just suck, so why bother having them in the first place? I don't really care about having a laundry list of options if most of my options are just a waste of time. Games like Just Cause 4 take this to the worst possible extreme, where you literally cannot attack a single enemy in the open world without starting a never-ending bombardment of enemies spawning on your location. Bro, there's like six more, what the fuck? This shit doesn't end! Bruh! Stop it! How far away do I have to get? If if I just stand in a bush, like just sit here and not move, will that will that work? Will they eventually just stop? <laughs> okay, no. No, they're just gonna spawn wherever they want. This game is literally structured in a way that the random bullshit content is the main content because of how frequently it occurs. And even in games that aren't nearly as headache inducing, the giant maps can serve as an excuse to pad out the runtime, to give off the illusion that there's just so much to do, when in reality, a lot of it is just empty terrain or filler content that you've already done 20 times before. I mean, Halo Infinite is like a 10 hour game with about five hours of actual content and then five hours of wasting time trying to get to the content. And when you have a giant open world that's filled with countless activities that are marked everywhere, it's impossible to discern how much of that content is actually worthwhile and how much of it is boring filler. How many people missed out on the handful of great side quests in Cyberpunk because they were too busy doing their 80th gang member shootout? I mean, I found a couple really cool side quests in Breath of the Wild, but how many more good ones did I miss out on because I stopped doing most of them after the 10th person sent me on a fetch quest to find an item I already had in my inventory? 
It also doesn't help when everything looks so similar. Like, where's the visual variety? The entirety of Halo Infinite feels like they took one 40 minute mission from Halo 1 and stretched it into a 10 hour game. It all looks the same. And wow, man, that tropical island setting sure is a dream and doesn't look identical to 20 other video games that have come out in the past decade. But even games with unique aesthetics can still have an issue with visual variety. Like, don't get me wrong, I really like the vibe of Mirror's Edge Catalyst, and I've spent about like 90 hours in the game because I loved doing the online time trials, but I fucking dare you to tell me that you wouldn't get confused without all the red markers guiding you because two thirds of that map looks exactly the same. No ground level stuff, no populated areas, no missions outside the city, just a bunch of empty white rooftops. And even open world games that I consider good like Breath of the Wild still have huge issues with variety and worthwhile content. Finding a shrine for the first time was awesome, but when there are 120 total shrines and about two thirds of them have no more complexity than walking in, doing a very basic puzzle that'll take you 30 seconds, or a copy and paste guardian fight before you collect another spirit orb, then the excitement of finding a shrine shrinks a bit. I mean hell, there are even shrines where it takes longer to load in and out of them than it takes to go through it and collect your orb. It's not that these are all bad, it's just that too many of them feel like mediocre filler shrines that are only there because the game needed to fill empty space. Now, I know, some of you are probably gearing up to tell me that these games are so big that it's not fair to expect them to have all this variety. It's just not feasible for developers making a game this massive. Well, that's part of the point. If you aren't going to have enough visual or gameplay variety to fill this big open world, then it sounds like the game didn't fucking need to be open world. And if you still want an open world, then it should be much smaller and more focused. Take Metro Exodus as the perfect example of how this should be done. That game is only about 15 to 20 hours long and it's structured in a very linear fashion so that the content is more focused and direct, but they still give you these visually and mechanically diverse open areas that have enough room to explore with a few highly curated side missions added to populate the extra space. But that space is only big enough for like four side quests per region, so that means there's no room for filler, just the good ones. You're attempting to stealthily free slaves from the interior of a beached oil ship. You're climbing up to a demon's nest, or you're finding an experiment gone wrong and getting some new gear. You don't need to worry about it ever feeling like repetitive filler because the devs aren't burdened by the pressure of filling out a giant map. When you only have room for a few side missions, you only need to include the best ones. If you shrink the game down, get rid of most of the filler, bam, much higher chance that it's a better game. But I know, I know what you're thinking. If that's my solution to modern open world design, then why the fuck do I think Elden Ring is so good? Because Elden Ring is like the polar opposite of Metro Exodus. And yeah, it's true. Elden Ring is massive and very open-ended. But for as big as the game is, it's the first open world game I've played that's managed to keep up a consistent level of quality throughout its entire runtime while still being extremely varied. This is legit just like four Souls games packed into one. And there's so much interesting shit to see and do. Does it mean the game is a perfect experience? Fuck no. And this open-ended structure works both to its benefit and its detriment as I'll talk about later, but its shortcomings are minuscule in the face of what the game gets right. So now let's dive in. What makes Elden Ring so worthwhile? Well, remember how I said bigger isn't always better? That statement is true, unless we're talking about a little thing called variety. Elden Ring is FromSoft's first attempt at a fully open world setting, and they take clear inspiration from the open-ended design of Breath of the Wild, where you have a general path the game subtly tells you to follow, but you can really just go wherever you want. Which makes it extremely fun to explore because it does feel open and free. If you see something interesting on the horizon, go and check it out. And if an enemy is too cracked or an area seems a bit daunting, that's fine, just go the other way. Realizing the scope of this game on a first playthrough is also an insanely exciting experience. You'll have about three or four moments where you think you've pinned down just how big it is, and then the game keeps getting bigger. It got so big that I started to worry if it'd be able to keep up the same level of quality, because without fail, every single other open world game I've played has reached a point where I just get burnt out and want to beeline the rest of it. This point usually comes when I feel like I've seen all that the game has to offer, it's not ramping up at all, or if the content just wasn't that interesting to begin with. Elden Ring, on the other hand, never burned me out, and it took me 144 hours to beat all the achievement bosses, do almost all the side content, and reach the credits, which is far longer than I've spent for a first playthrough on any other single player title. Every inch of this world has something in it, and it never stops. 
Each new area introduces tons of entirely new enemies and bosses, and the locations are insanely varied to the point where it's damn near impossible to spoil the game in a video, because no matter how much I show, there will still be more to see. Even Breath of the Wild, for as good as it looks and as big as it is, can't really hold a candle to the visual variety of Elden Ring. All of these different locations that I'm showing you right now are all places within the first region of the map. And once you start to go beyond that, it's just not a fair comparison anymore. I mean, there are multiple, expansive underground secret areas, there's an academy of evil sorcerers, there's a giant capital city that took me four hours to clear because it's packed with streets, buildings, rooftops, and sewers, the list goes on. And every single time I thought they might run out of ideas, bam, new shit. There are multiple hidden locations. Hidden locations within hidden locations. There is literally a secret boss fight that you can only find if you get eaten by one specific enemy in the game, who is already within a secret location to begin with. How many other games in existence can come anywhere close to this level of variety? None. I'll, I'll just answer that now. None. The answer is none. That sentiment is especially true when we talk about enemy variety, because Elden Ring just blows everything else out of the water. For as big as Breath of the Wild is, the devs kind of shrugged their shoulders when it came to designing new enemies, and mostly just changed the color of these three guys and called it a day. Ignoring the changes in enemy color, and if we're being pretty generous with our counting, Breath of the Wild only has about 28 unique enemies, and that number includes bats, blobs, pebbles, and all seven of the bosses. If we don't count these three bullshit enemies that hardly ever deal damage, then that's only 25 enemies and bosses for this 60 to 100 hour long game. What the fuck? Horizon Forbidden West is a 40 to 50 hour game, and it has around 43 different enemy types. And then for Ghost of Tsushima, which is another 40 hour game, there are only 10 normal enemies you can find in the open world. And that number only goes up to 34 if you count every duel and boss fight. Now, Elden Ring, on the other hand, has over 165 unique enemies and bosses in the game, god damn. And that's not even counting reskins or the hostile wildlife. Breath of the Wild has an estimated map size that is bigger than Elden Ring's, yet it has six times less enemy variety. There are 21 shrines in Breath of the Wild with a boss fight, and they are pretty much the same enemy over and over with only tiny tweaks in variation. If you enter one of these, you're fighting a low-level guardian that is incredibly easy to kill, and you're getting a guardian weapon and an orb as a reward. That's it. Every single time. If you enter a cave or catacomb in Elden Ring, sure you may see some bosses reused, but there are over 25 different kinds of bosses that you can find in a cave and catacomb alone, and even when they reuse them, they usually add something different. Oftentimes there's two, sometimes three, sometimes they have a mob of enemies around them. Hell, there's even an invisible guy in one of them. Does it mean everyone is amazing? No, of course not, and some bosses definitely didn't deserve to be reused like this little bitch. But those moments are significantly less frequent than the number of times when I was pleasantly surprised by finding something new. Especially when the layouts of these locations can be drastically different. Same thing goes for item variety and build diversity. Far too many open world games just don't have that many unique weapons or items and will lead to the player using like the same five things the entire game or sometimes the exact same thing the entire game. Or the reverse happens where the players will be bombarded with infinitely randomized options to the point where none of it actually feels special anymore. Breath of the Wild suffered severely from this in my opinion. On the surface it has a ton of weapons to choose from, except there's only actually six classes of weapons and that's kind of being generous. Big swords, small swords, spears, shields, and bows, and I guess these lame rods you can occasionally find. But no matter what weapon you use, it's gonna fall into one of those categories, and it will have the exact same animation and function as every other weapon in that category. It's just that the damage will be slightly different. And on top of that, these damn things break and can't be leveled up, which makes it even less interesting to find new weapons because nothing ever feels special or unique. Even the Master Sword, which is the only weapon in the game that doesn't permanently break, feels a lot less special when it's the only thing that's special. And it became the weapon I used almost exclusively for chopping trees or hitting rocks, because I knew it was the only one I had that I wouldn't completely waste by doing so. Ashen, a co-op open world Souls-like from 2019, was another game that had a massive problem with rewarding exploration. That game loved to place items in precarious spots, but every single one of them was just a shitty ass material you can find elsewhere in the world. Sapien root. Just or wait. boss. I called it! <laughs> yeah, I told you. See? That's all we pick up. Sapien roots and boss. That game also doesn't have any mini bosses, so there's not even a gameplay incentive to explore. 
Now, the point I'm trying to get at is that when I see a chest in Breath of the Wild, or when I find 30 randomly generated weapons on the ground in Cyberpunk or Dying Light 2, I don't really care as much, because I know it's going to be some expendable thing I've probably already seen. But when I found a chest or item in Elden Ring, I genuinely didn't know what it would be because there are 31 different classes of weapons in Elden Ring, with over 300 weapons total, and that's not even considering the over 50 different Ashes of War you can equip on your weapon, which can drastically change how you use them. There's also 70 sorceries available, and 101 different incantations you can use. And all of that is still ignoring the many talismans, great runes, unique special items, craftable items, and spirit ashes you can summon to your aid. You want a weapon that heals on kills and sends a beam of lava flying out? You want to gorge your eyes out and shoot madness lasers everywhere? You want to turn into a dragon, pizza cut some bitches, summon lightning, throw a fucking moon at people? You want to fight alongside Lizard Man? That's only scratching the surface of what's available in Elden Ring. It has an unbelievable amount of variety, and it almost feels comical at this point to try and play the numbers game with other open worlds, because Elden Ring is going to win in every category statistically. Now. I don't want to suggest that Elden Ring is absolved from any of the open world issues that I talked about before simply because of the scope. Because every open world game will have some issues in one way or the other. There's just always too many factors at play for it to be a 100% smooth sailing experience. So yeah, I think there are some shortcomings here. For example, I really like the catacombs, but they probably could have used more enemy types. These turtle puzzles, they kind of suck and probably could have been scrapped. A lot of the caves are cool, some are a bit bland. A good number of mini-bosses do get reused, and I think some deserved it, and some definitely did not. And I think it has some slight balancing issues around the midpoint. But for every misstep, the game has 30 other things that make up for it. And it's not just the variety of the content, it's the quality of the content and how that content is utilized. Now, like I just talked about, the exploration elements are a key part of Elden Ring's success, but it goes far beyond just simply having lots to explore. I really do think that Elden Ring's learning curve and complexity help the open world elements shine much more than in most other games. I talked earlier about games needing to have worthwhile items while exploring, but I also think the enemies themselves can be a reward for exploration. Finding an enemy you haven't seen before presents a new and exciting challenge, and even if you see them again down the road, it might be part of a new encounter and you can take your past knowledge and apply it to this new fight, which is a sign of your growth as a player. Now, look, I hate to keep picking on Breath of the Wild, but Finding a glowing dragon or this giant temple seems like it should be awesome, but both of them just boil down to single mechanic fights that are repeated over and over. When you see one of these guardian things, you parry the beams, and then the fight's over. That's it. You see a bunch of them in the game and it's all parrying the beams. And then you get rewarded for completing this temple with an empty shrine where you walk in and out in 15 seconds. Or this one, cool ass dragon, you, sh you shoot an arrow at the weak spot. That's it. That was the fight. It's over. And actually, these things don't even fight back, so it's kind of hard to call it a fight at all. Look, when a game loses the ability to surprise you, it just really weakens my desire to keep exploring. Because no matter how cool a place looks on the outside, if I know it's not going to have anything worthwhile in either the loot or the mechanics, I'm always going to walk away feeling a bit disappointed. The difficulty of side encounters in Elden Ring also just serve as a natural way to guide the player throughout the world without any handholding. Just in the first area alone, there are 20 different bosses to find, and several of them are very hard for a starting area, but that's part of the point. Elden Ring has a general structure of, things get harder the farther into it you get, but that's not always the case. The game will sporadically mix in enemies that are way harder than the rest of the area, which encourages the player to explore elsewhere and come back when they're ready. It creates a loop that works in two key areas. One, you have a visible goal in sight, get powerful and skilled enough to come back and finally face this enemy, and two, it directly encourages you to explore the other content in the game. Elden Ring also does a great job at subtly teaching players lessons within the fights themselves. Margit, the first main boss, teaches you that enemies can have very delayed attacks and will punish heal spamming, which both prepares you for future enemies with similar attacks, as well as teaches you that you're going to have to learn the patterns and timings and not just rely on your healing or damage output. This cycle works so well as a way to naturally give the player information and objectives without explicitly guiding them with 800 map icons or treating them like a six-year-old with endless text or hints telling them exactly what to do. In all fairness, this is part of what made Breath of the Wild so special, I just think that Elden Ring kind of one-ups it in this regard because of the difficulty and variety. 
I also think the mechanic of losing your runes upon death works extremely well in an open world setting. To me it made exploring new areas so much more tense and exhilarating because you actually have something tangible you can lose. It created so many moments where I had to ask myself, should I press on in search of a site of grace or should I turn back and spend my runes now knowing all the enemies I just cleared will respawn and I'll have to go through them again. It's a great little bit of risk and reward that I always appreciate in games and I think it just adds another layer to the game's already rich exploration. Now, if there were one thing we could all point to as the big feature of any FromSoft game, it would undoubtedly be the boss fights. I think boss fights in most AAA games, both open world and linear, are super underutilized, and even when they're included, they can kind of be pretty lackluster. For me, the biggest issue with a lot of AAA bosses is just that they're stupidly easy and don't expect nearly enough from the player. So much of the fun of Elden Ring is having to learn each new boss or enemy. Most of them can be fucking assholes at first, but that's the point. They all have their own unique moves and tells that you have to learn in order to beat them. You should get clapped on your first few attempts, but by the time you finally win, you'll feel like a better player as a result. I mean, my first few attempts at Margit are completely different from what it looks like when I go to him now. And I used to get absolutely slaughtered by this spider bitch. And while it took me- It's impossible. That shit is impossible. And while it took me a while to figure- Does he stop? Does he stop? Does he stop? And while it took me a while to figure him out, I eventually did, and it felt amazing. Most other games don't offer this experience because they're far too simple. Ashen had some decent boss ideas, but was so straightforward and easy that I legit died one time total throughout all five main bosses in that game. Breath of the Wild has some really cool fights, but it feels nearly impossible to die because you can literally pause the game and heal back to full health at any time. And that's not even mentioning the final boss, which I'm not even sure if it's possible to take damage during that fight. If anyone has, let me know, because I just still don't think it is. And while the duels and arenas in Ghost of Tsushima are pretty cool, the parry window is insanely generous, and spamming special attacks or mashing triangle is all it takes to trivialize the fights. And that right there is my biggest problem with super basic boss fights. If something is so simple that you don't have to actually learn any of the mechanics, then the fights just blur together in my opinion. Now, I know this is definitely speaking to the fact that I value the learning experience and personal player growth during these games, which is one of the reasons why I love Doom Eternal so much because I'm a vastly different player by the end of that game than I was at the start, and I love that feeling. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is how all games should be, and I can certainly have a lot of fun with the chill experience or gorgeous spectacle of other games like The Pathless. I mean, right from the start, that game just lets you know, yeah, this is about the art and vibes, and I love that game. But if you'll notice, The Pathless is only 8 hours long, so it gets in and gets out. If you're gonna have these massive games that require me to spend 40, 50, 60 plus hours long just to finish the main story, I would really, really appreciate if the difficulty and complexity curve wasn't looking like a flat line for most of the game. I'm not saying these games just need to be artificially difficult, but I am saying that I do want them to expect more from the player. Without that, a lot of AAA open world games just feel like they're going through the motions and are purposely oversimplified, because it's not just a matter of a difficulty slider. I mean, putting Ghost of Tsushima on lethal mode doesn't change how basic and repetitive I found the combat. And based on how many people in my comments have told me that Ghost of Tsushima is, in fact, not Dark Souls, I'm worried that far too many people seem to think that the Soul series is only highly regarded because it's just some like weird, absurdly difficult thing that only capital G gamers enjoy and not because of the structure, level design, progression, learning curve, enemy encounters, risk reward system, or any other gameplay element that helps it stand out. And just to address some of the comments on my Ghost of Tsushima video, telling me how every game can be broken down into a super reductionist statement that it's only really about dodging and hitting, so isn't everything simple? By that logic, every game is boring. No, no, no. That is Goo Goo Gaga baby brain talk. Yes, both of these games technically have quote-unquote simple mechanics, but there's a huge difference in how they're used. Here's the entirety of a mid-game boss fight in Ghost of Sushi. The island! Careful, Tamugi. You can't get Kutun's reward if you're dead. A lucky blow! You will not get another! You sure about that? I'm just pressing triangle right now. Just pressing triangle. You have killed men in many I'm, countries. I'm just pressing triangle. Yeah. You die. Alright, well, apparently Jin didn't want to do his charge up attack. You know. I 
just beat that pressing triangle! And here's me trying the same technique on a starting enemy in Elden Ring. You see what I mean? My point is that while the main roll, block, and hit mechanics are technically simple, the way you're forced to mix them up based on the incredibly varied enemies and challenging encounters is far from simple. I mean, come on, the final boss of Ghost of Tsushima has three main attacks, which is uh, two less than the fucking beast man of Faramazula, who you will probably find within 20 minutes of playing Elden Ring, and then he becomes a mob enemy later. And even small things can go a long way in making the game feel varied and unique. Walk into the first main dungeon, get fucked. Okay, now I learned that these birds are actually dickheads, and I should use a ranged weapon or try to bait them out first. I can't think of a single time in Ghost of Tsushima where I came across a new enemy or area that made me consider adjusting my playstyle in even the slightest way. But I will acknowledge that there is an argument to be made, and I'm sure some people are probably already typing it, that many open world games are meant to be a simple and relaxing experience and instead give you the freedom to tackle objectives how you want. And some of the other comments I got were uh, ones telling me that it's not the game's fault that I can mash triangle until I win, it's mine for not making my own fun. Well, I actually think that's a kind of interesting line of thinking and it's worth analyzing, so let's do that. And this will finally give me a chance to talk about something that I've been meaning to mention, bandit camps. Remember earlier where I mentioned how bandit camps are used to fill space? Yeah, well, I think these can often fill space in the worst kind of way. Now, be honest, how many bandit camps have you completed in open world games? Think about it for a second, okay? Are you ready? All right, if you're about to tell me less than 100, then I know you've probably only played about four open world games before because Ghost of Tsushima alone has 56 goddamn bandit camps. Jesus Christ. Ubisoft is notorious for popularizing the use of these specifically marked camps, but half of the main and side missions are usually still just glorified bandit camps, even if it's not technically listed as one in your quest log. I mean, you just walk into an area with enemies that are standing out in the open, shoot them in the head, mission over. Walk in, kill 10 enemies, on to the next. Look, bandit camps are fine to have in your open world. My problem is that most open world games usually don't use them in an interesting way, yet they still lean on them as a crutch for their overall design philosophy of player freedom. It's far easier to just plop a bunch of enemies in a camp, tell the players to have at it and make their own fun, and then call it a day, than it is to actually design an interesting scenario, unique mission, or cool location. These games can say that this is about giving the player options, but too often it feels like just a cop-out instead of having actual design with any form of problem solving or a unique approach. The enemies are usually the exact same as the ones you've already fought, and they just sit there and wait to die. So your freedom is essentially, will you kill this guy first or this guy? Will you press square or triangle to kill him? By that logic, sure, you technically have a lot of options, but when it's all so easy and straightforward that everything you do just works, then nothing feels interesting because it's near impossible to fail or do the wrong thing. This oversimplicity also makes me feel less encouraged to switch it up or do new things because it doesn't matter. Why would I swap to the shield or dash abilities in Halo Infinite when the grapple hook already allows for both dashing out of the way and going behind cover? Why would I bother trying to play Ghost of Tsushima stealthily or focus on stance switching if it's just going to take longer than simply running in, spamming my abilities, and parrying everyone? These games overload you with so much shit to do that if the content doesn't engage me with any level of complexity after the first few hours, I'm just naturally driven towards a more efficient route, especially when your actions don't even have an effect on the story. But even Breath of the Wild, a game built around its supposed mechanical freedom and variety, has over 50 of these big skull enemy camps with the same three enemy types just sitting there waiting to die. Despite having multiple mechanics at your disposal, you have to go out of your way to actually use them because the game rarely presents you with a unique challenge or situation. What's the point of having all these cool abilities if the game doesn't give me a good reason to actually use them? I don't like the philosophy of having the player make their own fun. This just feels like weak design to me. I could spend 10 minutes setting up a way to hit these guys with a boulder, or I could just walk in and kill them in 20 seconds because the game is very easy. 
Would it not be significantly more interesting if there were some camps you could only beat by using the stasis and magnet abilities to move platforms around to get to enemies above you? Or if you had to utilize the ice blocks to like cross a river or something? Or if there was a series of gliding sections between platforms? Or if one of them had a puzzle where you could only kill the enemies or unlock the chest with bombs and chain reactions and, and so on and so forth, you get the picture. Imagine if these so-so puzzles in the shrines were suddenly surrounded with enemies you had to navigate mid-puzzle. To me, that immediately makes these more interesting because now I have to balance fighting enemies and solving a puzzle. And that is precisely what Elden Ring does with its many catacombs and heroes graves. You have to navigate through a series of small puzzles all while fighting off different enemies with your end goal of unlocking a boss fight. That's like taking most of the major pieces of content in Breath of the Wild and combining it into one small area. Look, I'm sorry, but that's just infinitely more interesting to me. And yes, I know that that's kind of what the Divine Beast dungeons do, but there's only four of those, and it's not a good look when the gargoyles and skeletons are significantly outclassing the stationary eyeball enemies in these Divine Beasts. And I understand that this is definitely a personal preference thing, and I know that some people are happy that Nintendo made the shrines super simple because it gives you room to experiment, but to me, I'd rather that the puzzle just didn't suck ass to begin with, instead of allowing me the freedom to place an ice block in front of this. And even the few standard banded camps in Elden Ring are still more engaging than most other banded camps, because at least the enemies are different nearly every time you find one, and there's always the possibility of finding a unique piece of gear, or a trap chest that will teleport you to a crazy part of the map, which certainly can't be said of any of the chests in Breath of the Wild. So much of the content in these open world games just blur together for me and feel less like missions and quests and more like boxes to check on an endless list of activities designed to make me spend as much time as possible with the game. And even if a game doesn't have traditional bandit camps, I'm still very concerned every time I see the idea of player freedom being thrown around when talking about an open world. Because I really do think it can just be an excuse for lack of proper design. Now, as some of you know, I absolutely hate Sea of Thieves. To be fair, maybe the game has changed by now, I haven't played it since 2017. But, at launch, the combat was terrible, and every single mission in the game was a fetch quest where you picked up a crate and brought it back to base. That is it. That is legitimately the only type of quest in that game at launch. And there were no secrets, no actual side characters, just a bunch of merchants, and not even any new items or weapons to find. There was just nothing to do! Yet when I went online, I saw the devs talking about how they designed the game that way to give you player freedom. Freedom to do fucking what? Sail to another empty island? Spend money on clothes that I can't even see because the game is first person? And now whenever I see one of these new games coming out with these vast stretches of empty space, I just ask, why? What is inherently interesting about these wide areas where you're free to waste time? Would the game not be better suited if it were just a smaller, more focused, more polished game? Now look, despite all I've said, and some of you may not believe me when I say this, but I don't hate all the games I've talked about. I mean, some, yes, I definitely hate some of them, but a lot of them are just really disappointing to me. Because I like the core mechanics or ideas, I just really wish they were actually utilized to their full potential. And frankly, a lot of them don't need to be open world games. Ghost of Tsushima should have been a super intense linear action game that never lets up the gas pedal for like, maybe 15 hours, instead of being a bland 40 hour open world that is afraid to pick a lane for what story it wants to tell. Cyberpunk 2077 should have just been Human Revolution 2.0, like that's it, it should have just copied that game. Dying Light 2 could have been a really cool like 20 hour RPG where your actions can completely change the shape of the world, instead of a 60 hour open world where your actions sort of start to slightly change the aesthetics of outposts. I mean come on, switching to an open world didn't stop Mirror's Edge Catalyst from having a bland story and really stilted combat sections which were, you know, the problems of the first game that should have been addressed in the sequel instead of adding an open world to hop on the trend. And I really hope Breath of the Wild will learn from the first game and find a much better way to utilize its really fun mechanics, but their near unanimous praise does make me slightly worried that it'll be more of the same. I mean, maybe it can learn from Elden Ring now that it's been delayed, but I'm still a bit concerned. 
Oof, okay, um, I know this essay is kind of snowballed a bit, and I feel the need to reiterate that there are always going to be some exceptions and not everything needs to follow the same pattern, but I really hope going forward, games take the right lessons away from Elden Ring if they want to still have an open world. Elden Ring isn't better just because it's big and open, and while the less intrusive HUD elements and minimal hand-holding do help, the insane variety of content and the complexity of the enemies and encounters are what sets Elden Ring apart. I can easily say that I consider Elden Ring the best open world game, and any upcoming standard open world is going to feel even less interesting in the shadow of Elden Ring. If you've made it this far, I sincerely thank you for watching. This is one of the first videos I've made of this kind, and in all honesty, it was not easy to get together. I went back and rewrote this thing so many times, and it was nearly twice as long at one point, so I'm happy I was able to get it together in the shape that it's in. If you enjoyed it, leave a like or a comment, and if you disagree, feel free to leave a comment letting me know why. This is obviously my subjective opinion, and it's far from the word of God, so I'm always open to hearing what others think. Thanks again for watching, and stay tuned for some more content. I have another short film that I shot last month coming out soon, probably in a week or two, and I may or may not be making a video on Neon White. Either way, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.